right, everyone, why don't we get started? Um, welcome. Thanks for coming to Grand Rounds. We have an exciting uh, panel today to talk to us, and I will turn it over to Dr. Levin to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, I'm excited to introduce a multi multidisciplinary panel discussion about the management of neuroendocrine tumors by our Mount Sinai experts, Dr. Celia Devino, Dr. Emily Gallagher, Dr. Edward Wollen, and moderated by Dr. Michelle Kim. Dr. Devino is the Stanley Edelman Professor of Surgery and Program Director and Vice Chair for General Surgery. She specializes in advanced techniques for laparoscopic gastrointestinal neuroendocrine and carcinoid surgeries. Dr. Gallagher is an Assistant Professor of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Bone Disease, Associate Program Director for Research, and Director of the Research Pathway for the Internal Medicine Residency Program. She's an MD-PhD clinician researcher with an NIH-funded research program studying the mechanisms through which systemic metabolic conditions contribute to cancer growth and progression. Dr. Wolin is a Professor of Medicine and Medical Oncology and the Director of the Center for Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumors at the Tisch Cancer Institute. Dr. Wolin has pioneered innovative therapies in neuroendocrine tumor care. And Dr. Kim is an MD-PhD clinician researcher and the Vice Chair for Faculty Affairs for the Department of Medicine and a Professor of Medicine and Gastroenterology and the Director of the Center for Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumors at Mount Sinai, as well as the Chair of the Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumor Section of the American Gastroenterological Association. Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to Grand Rounds. Thanks so much, Emily. That was quite a mouthful. Um, I know that um, uh, you and uh, Dr. Thomas uh, and your colleagues had requested um, a more multidisciplinary presentation of uh, carcinated neuron tumors. And so I think with this um, terrific panel that uh, you'll see that uh, this is a, a very close knit collaboration and uh, we hope that uh, this is informative uh, for the group. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to get started with uh, our financial disclosures as below. Um, I think a question that often comes up is, is why neuroendocrine tumors? Um, it certainly is a rare disease, um, but it is one with uh, increasing incidence and one that actually has a very high prevalence because many patients do very well for a long period of time. And so actually, um, if you add up uh, esophageal, gastric, uh, and pancreatic cancer, neuroendocrine tumors are actually, uh, there are nearly 200 cases, 200,000 cases. Um, in the United States, and actually it adds up to uh, more than those three cancers combined. Um, actually is a, a really fascinating disease. Um, there's a wide spectrum of biologic behavior and it's very uh, challenging to treat and to be able to predict how patients will do short-term and long-term. Uh, as I mentioned, patients often live for many years, um, uh, but there can be significant morbidity and mortality. And so again, you're balancing the needs of an individual patient um, against uh, their treatments um, and predicting how they will do. And I think, um, as some of you may know, um, we actually have a very unique experience here at Sinai, uh, especially a very high volume um, that has uh, been present for over several decades. Um, and so this has uh, really led to um, a conglomeration of uh, experts who have been here for many years and have practiced here for decades. Just to um, sort of underscore this increase in, in incidence that I was talking about before, uh, this here is a paper published by Dasari uh, and colleagues in JAMA Oncology in 2017. As you can see, um, there has been really a consistent rise in many neuroendocrine tumors over the past several decades. So this includes uh, the lung, which you can see here up in blue, uh, and then also rather this uh, stool colored one in uh, the small intestine, uh, as well as those in the rectum. So these are really the three most common sites that we see, uh, but we also see quite a lot of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as outlined here in gray, as well as those in the appendix um, and in the cecum and other areas in the GI tract. And so just to ensure that everybody here is on the same page, really the origin of an endocrine tumor is the enterochromaffin cell. It's widely distributed throughout the body, especially prevalent in the submucosa of the GI tract and the bronchi. And I think what everyone really remembers from medical school and from training is that this really produces a variety of biogenic amines and peptide hormones um, that you can see there. And that when you have excess levels of these substances that you get very interesting and very dramatic uh, clinical presentations that it can include carcinoid syndrome with the dramatic flushing and diarrhea, as well as let's say the VIPomas um, with the very severe cholera-like diarrheal syndromes. And so 
um, you know, not all tumors uh, secrete hormones with recognizable uh, uh, hormones uh, with the recognizable clinical syndromes. But, um, you know, certainly this is what is the most striking um, aspect, I think, of these tumors. Um, just to let you know, in terms of the way that we think about these neuroendocrine tumors, we tend to classify them by site from embryologic origin. And so you can see here that some of these foregut uh, tumors um, with these uh, sites above, um, including those of the pancreas, um, the midguts um, are those neuroendocrine tumors that often will have those uh, carcinoid syndrome uh, pictures with the dramatic flushing and diarrhea. And then you get sort of more of these hindgut uh, tumors with those in the distal colon and the rectum. I think I really want to um, sort of emphasize that um, although carcinoid syndrome may be that clinical syndrome that you remember the best, it actually really occurs in quite a minority of patients. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, generally this is going to be associated with midgut primaries. And so you will not see these in the pancreas generally or in the rectum. Um, generally it will be associated with metastatic disease. And so with more localized disease, this may be, not be something that you see. The clinical manifestations often caused by uh, an overproduction of serotonin, um, which as we remember is uh, metabolized by the liver into 5-HIAA. Um, you really have then um, in the presence of uh, liver and ovarian metastases, uh, serotonin entering systemic circulation. And oftentimes the degree of severity of the carcinoid syndrome can really depend on the volume of the disease and also the location. And so just to uh, remind everyone that you've got this uh, these metabolic pathways um, where um, serotonin is, is synthesized um, from tryptophan and um, catalyzed by tryptophan hydroxylase uh, and then uh, the aromic, uh, ar ar aromatic acid uh, decarboxylase and actually manufactured into serotonin. Just wanted to show you here a picture, a courtesy of uh, Dick Warner, who many of you may remember, and the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation. You can see here the very dramatic um, carcinoid flush and sort of the real um, sort of redness that you get in the face and also in the chest. And you can see here there's some blanching of um, the fingertips. Uh, you can see that once the flush is over, that uh, you still have a residual uh, redness, uh, oftentimes over the bridge of the nose and into the cheeks. Uh, you can also have residual telangiectasias. And so um, this is uh, a very dramatic example of what you may see with a carcinoid flush. Um, as a gastroenterologist uh, representative of, in this panel, um, I think one thing that we always consider is um, abdominal fibrosis, again, in these mid-gut primaries. Um, oftentimes we find that patients have a delay in diagnosis and that um, you can have mistaken diagnoses, whether there is irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease, especially in uh, this location here at Mount Sinai. Um, a lot of patients um, actually will present with abdominal pain and require surgery. And again, so we will hear more uh, from Dr. Davino. Um, oftentimes with um, peritumoral mesenteric fibrosis and intestinal obstruction, um, entrapment of mesenteric vessels that may lead to ischemic bowel um, and retroperitoneal fibrosis, which uh, may lead to complications in the kidney. So this is often really not just uh, a local disease, but often one that is systemic and that is um, uh, really affecting many different organs. Um, we've got here a few classic images of what some conventional imaging may look like. And so this is sort of the older small bowel series where you see a filling defect here in the terminal ileum. And this is a very classic location for where some of these mid-gut primary lesions may, uh, may exist. Then you can see here sort of this very classic appearing um, sort of stellate appearing um, scar from the fibrosis from mesenteric mass with the small bowel around it. Um, and so again, this can be a very classic uh, picture for neuronocon tumors, especially in the mid gut. Um, you know, I think one thing that another, uh, that may be very memorable for a lot of you in the audience is that, you know, our treatise scans for many decades were the workhorse of uh, how we staged and imaged um, our patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And one thing I think I'd like to uh, get across today is that um, there's actually really a new kit on the block here, the 68 gallium uh, Dota Tate, Dota Talk uh, scans. Uh, here at Sinai, we do the Dota Tate. And what you can see here is that this has really increased sensitivity, increased specificity. It, it takes advantage of the same mechanism of overexpression of the somatostatin receptor on these neuroendocrine tumors, which then uh, leads to uh, really outstanding imaging, as you can see here. 
Um, it, you know, something to, to note also is that because of the increased sensitivity between octreotide scans on the left and uh, these uh, gallium 68 scans here on the right, um, that it's really important when you advise patients and especially when they get their first gallium scan that they may feel like the disease has exploded. Uh, they um, feel like all of a sudden there's a lot more uh, disease here than they ever knew about in perhaps a decade of disease before. Um, and I think something to really ensure that uh, patients are aware of is that this is really more detection bias. This does not necessarily represent that disease is pressed, but really, again, more that there is an increased sensitivity and therefore that you will detect more disease. Um, and so um, before handing it over to uh, Dr. Wolin, I just sort of really wanted to um, give quite a bit of uh, acknowledgement um, and uh, credit here to our dear colleague, uh, Dick Warner, who um, you know, started at Sinai and uh, had uh, over 60 years of experience with carcinated and urinary tumors and really showed me that it was possible to have a specialty in this um, you know, very rare, but uh, otherwise very fascinating condition. And you know, over his lifetime, um, has you know really had seen thousands and thousands of patients. And I know that my patients still uh, ask about him, and and he's uh, doing quite well um, and uh, mentally as as sharp as ever. Uh, and so um, I really want to give credit to uh, to Dick Warner, who was my mentor for many, for many years, and really really was the the start of the neurodegenerative tumor practice here at Mount Sinai. Uh, but I think, you know, one thing I wanted to do also was to really emphasize how wonderful it has been to have uh, Ed Wolin join our uh, team. Uh, he came in several years ago and has really been a terrific leader and wonderful colleague and collaborator, uh, has really taken the Nordic Consumer Center here um, to uh, sort of the, the new heights and new uh, uh, places. And I think especially uh, with his expertise in uh, clinical research and in clinical trials, um, he has been uh, just, as I said, a, a really wonderful uh, asset uh, to Mount Sinai and the Neurocon Tumor Center here. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Wolin, and uh, he'll be giving the next section of this talk. Thank you, Michelle. It's a great pleasure and honor to be able to speak to you today and um, share with you some of the excitement about um, treatment and management of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Um, I came here, as Michelle said, a few years ago to direct this um, exciting center. It's growing very, very rapidly and so much is happening. We'll try to share some of the excitement with you. One of the things that we did was to set up a multidisciplinary neuroendocrine tumor board that meets every single week and we talk about um, somewhere close to 10 uh, new patients or patients with major problems with all the major players at the table so we can come up with uh, management plans. It's very unusual to have a dedicated neuroendocrine tumor board. There are only a few in the whole, um, in the whole world, really, um, including all of these specialties, many of whom are here with you today. Next slide, please. I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of multidisciplinary management of a neuroendocrine tumor <clears throat> and how, the roles that these different individuals play and why we have this discussion we're having today with multiple specialists. Surgery is key in managing neuroendocrine tumors. Whenever surgery is possible, surgery is always the first go-to item. You can resect a primary tumor and associated nodes for potential cure. And it's really the only potential cure for localized neuroendocrine tumors that we have. In metastatic disease, patients can benefit by resection of metastases in the abdomen, in the liver, or other places in the body, so-called cytoreductive surgery or debulking surgery. There aren't too many tumors where removing bulk of tumor makes a difference. Ovarian cancer might be an example, but there are... Um, clear data at this point, even though it's not randomized data from all around the country, that patients that have had tumor cytoreduction live longer and higher quality lives. Liver transplantation is considered in rare cases. Cholecystectomy is done whenever somebody has metastatic disease and they're already having an abdominal procedure since the chances of having um, cholecystitis develop is so high when you have 
somatostatin analog therapy, which is almost universal in people that have the receptors, as you saw in the gallium dotate pet a little bit earlier. If you're treated with octreotide or lamreotide somatostatin analogs, it inhibits cholecystokinin. You end up getting um, gallstones and often symptomatic cholecystitis. It's better to take the gallbladder out prophylactically if you're in the abdomen. If you're not already in the abdomen and somebody has metastatic disease, you don't do a cholecystectomy prophylactically just for fun. But if you're already doing an abdominal surgery, it doesn't really significantly increase morbidity. Interventional radiology has a key role, hepatic artery embolization by blocking the circulation to, to the tumors. Tumors get almost all of their blood supply through the hepatic artery, whereas normal liver parenchyma gets almost all of its blood supply through the portal vein. So by blocking the hepatic artery with lipid materials or with tiny beads, it's possible to starve out the tumor. They die uh, within the liver and very effectively can uh, control neuroendocrine cancers. It can be done with uh, radioactively labeled beads. It can be done with chemotherapy, uh, trapped in the uh, liver with beads. There are different techniques, although nowadays we do mostly bland embolization, which is only occlusion and not using radiation since it probably increases the risk of radiation-induced liver disease when patients have subsequent treatments with radiation to the liver, which we'll be talking about. Systemic therapy is um, something that is near and dear to my heart and is increasing in its utility very, very rapidly. We have somatostatin analogs. We have radioactively labeled somatostatin analogs, so-called peptide receptor radiotherapy or PRRT. We have therapy directed at other molecular targets in the cells. We have uh, chemotherapy in certain situations, particularly pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer. All of this is important. We have new developments in symptom management, carcinoid syndrome, as mentioned by Dr. Kim. We have somatostatin analogs, which reduce serotonin and help control carcinoid syndrome. We also have specific blockers of tryptophan hydroxylase, which can um, prevent the formation of serotonin. As you remember, that's the rate limiting enzyme that takes tryptophan into tryptophan. 5-hydroxytryptophan, and then 5-hydroxytryptamine is the next step. So you can block it at the rate limiting step. And we also can remove tumors and that thereby remove amount of hormones being produced by various types of ablation and um, surgical site of reduction. There are other syndromes that happen, such as Cushing syndrome, which can be surgically managed with a laparoscopic bilateral adrenalectomy, as well as multiple medical managements. Um, and uh, uh, high-dose PPIs are used in treating gastrinomas and so on. So in addition to treating the cancer, we have to treat the hormones being made by the cancer. The next slide, please. I just wanted to briefly uh, share with you the current grading system of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and GI uh, neuroendocrine tumors. They're basically divided into two broad groups, the well-differentiated group, the poorly differentiated group. The discussions we're gonna be having today are gonna to be on well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. The high-grade neuroendocrine tumors are like small cell carcinoma of the lung and high-grade large cell um, neuroendocrine tumor. They're very, very aggressive. Carcinomas are treated with aggressive chemotherapy, very much uh, like small cell lung cancer is with uh, platinum and etoposide, for example. And that's a separate item. But the well-differentiated tumors are the ones that have somatostatin receptors, the ones that are targeted by multiple types of biologics. And uh, th those are the carcinoids and other similar tumors. And those are the ones we're discussing today. Next slide, please. Since 2011, there's been an explosion of new treatments that are proven by phase one trials to have level one evidence of effectiveness. We had nothing before 2011. There was no approved drug in the United States for a carcinoid tumor. And now we have uh, multiple drugs. Um, and we'll be talking about some of these later. Sunitinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Everolimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor, Lanreotide, which is a um, somatostatin analog, and radioactively labeled uh, uh, octreotide, also known as PRRT, Lutetium 177 dota octreotate, that's what dotatate means, is the radioactive material. 
And uh, I was fortunate enough to be very much involved in the development of three out of these four and authors of the New England Journal papers. Next uh, slide, please. So this is a graphical or a diagrammatic uh, view of the same. Before 2011, the only drug out there was streptozosin for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, a rather toxic intravenous chemotherapy, a very awkward administration schedule, very unpleasant drug for patients, one that can lead to kidney failure, and one which is very, very rarely used today, and that was all we had. In 2011, there was a sudden burst of activity. Everolimus was FDA approved, the mTOR inhibitor for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and then for all types of other um, gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, lung neuroendocrine tumors, sunitinib for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, glanreotide for all types of uh, gastrointestinal and um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, the Everolimus trial for the midgut and lung came a little after the pancreatic, but it's the same drug. Tilotristat, which is a fantastic inhibitor of tryptophan hydroxylase, reduces tryptophan um, ability to uh, convert into serotonin peripherally, but doesn't do anything to the serotonin being made in the brain. So you don't end up being seriously depressed while your diarrhea is getting better, but you can have your diarrhea get better from this peripherally acting tryptophan hydroxylase inhibitor. It's an amazing drug. You can lower the serotonin level by another 40 or 50% after what can be accomplished with the somatostatin analog. And then in 2016, we had lutetium-17 dotatate, the PRRT, the radioactive material for refractory carcinoid tumors. Next slide. Um, this is just to give you a little cartoon of some of the multiple medical targets that we're um, accessing right now, not only the drugs that have been approved, but multiple drugs that are in clinical trial. I can mention a few of them later on, but there are multiple pathways that are being um, attacked right now. Next slide. Uh, there are just two or three trials I wanted to share with you in detail because it's uh, so important to understanding how we go about managing our cases. The first is lanreotide. Octreotide is a somatostatin analog, which was out for a longer period, uh, but lanreotide is the one with the most robust evidence of effectiveness and the one which is FDA approved as an anti-cancer drug, with octreotide being approved as a treatment for symptoms only. This is approved for symptoms and for cancer control. Randomized trial that goes by the nickname of clarinet, you can see how the sort of ridiculous process of picking letters out of words to make clarinet uh, was done with the yellow letters, uh, randomized trial between lanreotide and placebo. You can see the next uh, slide. It might be a little hard to read from the back, but this is um, to show you the amazing effectiveness of lanreotide. This is something that we presented at uh, ASCO uh, just a couple of years ago, 2017. The long-term follow-up data on that study that I showed you, the clarinet trial. The people that got octreotide for small intestine neuroendocrine tumors, the average progression-free survival was 61 and a half months, which is really amazing, just from a hormonal treatment with very few side effects compared to other cancer treatments, um, 61 and a half months. For pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and for the whole study as a group, the median progression-free survival was 31.5 months. Next slide. This is showing you the concept of peptide receptor radiotherapy. What you see in green target is the somatostatin receptor that's on neuroendocrine cells. The type two somatostatin receptor is on 90% of neuroendocrine cancers, and it can be used as a very effective target. It's a G protein coupled receptor. When it binds with an agonist, which in this case is a triotate, it binds with the agonist and then it gets internalized within the cell the way um, G protein coupled receptors work. So it gets stuck in the cancer cells. And then the uh, lutetium-177, which is the cytotoxic unit most commonly used, lutetium-177 has a two millimeter beta. So the tumors are really nuked and the surrounding uh, little area in the middle of the tumor is the tumor is caught in a crossfire of lutetium-177 beta coming out, 
but the surrounding collateral damage is only two millimeters around the tumor. So you could have 20 tumors in your liver and not have a problem with liver function, which is very nice. I mentioned earlier that radioembolization with Y90 does seem to increase the risk. Y90 has a uh, beta that travels 12 millimeters and there's a lot more collateral damage. And when you add to that lutetium 177, uh, the things are worse. Lutetium 177 fits inside this chelator, okay? That's where the cytotoxic unit goes. Now, when you want to use a scan, you put the scanning isotope. We're using both gallium-68, which was previously mentioned, and another one called copper-64. Both of these make beautiful PET scans, and you can put the scanning agent in the same chelator. So you have the same ligand sticking to the same target with the same binding affinity. So we have a system that we call Theranostics. We have a therapy and a diagnostic molecule, which are essentially the same, just a different isotope in the chelator. So if you have strong binding with the gallium dotate PET, for example, you have a really powerful predictor, a molecular predictor that lutetium-177 will be an effective therapy. So this is, is really wonderful. So we use the gallium dotate PET to predict who is going to benefit from somatostatin analogs and who is going to benefit from PRRT, the peptide receptor radiotherapy that comes from putting lutetium here. Next slide. This was the randomized trial that we did with PRRT in the United States and Europe, goes by the nickname of NETRA1, a randomized trial between doubling the dose of octreotide, of cold octreotide, the normal approved maximal dose is, six, is 30 milligrams IM every four weeks. This was people who progressed on that were given 60 milligrams IM every four weeks to be sure the somatostatin receptors were totally blocked. That was the control group. The treated group got the radioactive material, a total of four um, intravenous infusions as an outpatient over a period of eight months. So one time every two months, an infusion in the nuclear medicine department. The median progression-free survival at the time of this publication wasn't reached, but it, it's turning out to be somewhere between three and a half and four years. And there's probably a survival benefit as well. Uh, although that is not yet statistically significant. Next slide, please. This is showing you another example of theranostics in action. This is um, on the left, you'll see a, a, a gallium 68 dotate PET. And you'll see these two tumors in the liver very clearly. This is a fused image where you have a CAT scan right here that shows one of them and doesn't definitively tell you it's a tumor, it's a thing. But here you know it's a neuroendocrine tumor and you see the other one so clearly. Patient was treated with PRRT by uh, Dr. Richard uh, Baum in Germany. And you can see the CAT scan became completely clear after one cycle of PRRT that those tumors are still sitting there in the liver. A second cycle of PRRT was given. CAT scan again remains clear, but you can see the liver is now clear as well. Instead of going for four cycles like we usually do, this patient stopped after two, and you could see the first indicator of recurrence or these spots here in the liver that showed up uh, certainly way before they showed up on the CAT scan. So this is a very powerful diagnostic and predictive test that we use to plan our treatments. Next uh, slide. Uh, just uh, briefly tell you that chemotherapy usually does not work very well in neuroendocrine tumors, but pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are a big exception. Randomized trial of temozolomide plus or minus capecitabine, two oral easily tolerated pills, basically had a major um, response rate of 33%, about a third of the patients had a tumor shrinkage, and most of the remaining patients had stability of disease. So for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, this type of chemotherapy is remarkable. Uh, next slide. So this is a summary of the systemic options that we talked about and always include the option of a clinical trial when one is available in certain very highly selected cases where the tumors are so slowly growing, they hardly change over a period of years. Patients sometimes could be observed for years without therapy. And then when things start progressing, could start uh, a somatostatin analog, for example. Next slide. So last thing before we have our 
patient discussion and we talk about how we put these different modalities together, I just wanted to put some ideas in your head about um, how we make these decisions as a group. The first thing is, is the tumor localized or is it metastatic? If it's localized, you think of surgery, you think of ablation, you think of getting rid of the cancer. Generally, the first option is always surgery, as I mentioned. If it's metastatic, it doesn't mean surgery is not an option. It certainly is as well, but the goals of treatment and the ways that we sequence treatments may be different. Next thing is cytometastasis. These tumors most commonly arise in the small intestine. That's the single most common site. And the venous drainage of the small intestine is through the portal vein. And the tumor cells that metastasize in the bloodstream end up in the liver. So you can often have a situation with 20, 30, 40, 50 liver metastases and practically nothing anywhere else in the body. So this gives an opportunity to treat the liver. If you have only a limited number of metastases, they could be treated with resection or ablation. If you have lots of metastases, they could be treated with hepatic artery embolization. And you don't have to give these treatments to the entire body. You can focus the treatments on the organ that needs the treatment the most. And remaining normal liver is pretty resilient and actually can regenerate quite well after um, insults like this, and you can end up with perfectly uh, normal liver volume and liver function. If disease is widely metastatic, for example, if you have a lung carcinoid, which goes all through the body, or you have any carcinoid, which is or neuroendocrine tumor, which is widely metastatic, these patients need to rely on systemic therapy primarily. The pathology is really important. A lot of patients have inadequate pathology read on the outside by people who aren't experienced, and you can make a very big mistake in planning treatment if you think it's poorly differentiated and it's really well differentiated. And if it's high grade, is it high grade neuroendocrine tumor that's well differentiated or poorly differentiated high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma? Another thing that's really important is to use your head. Don't just rely on a pathology report. It's so common that a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is diagnosed by a fine needle aspiration done at endoscopic ultrasound, for example. And if you have a diagnosis made by a fine needle aspiration, and it looks like it's not a very high grade tumor because you don't see a lot of mitoses in this little tiny specimen, you might think it's a slow growing tumor and treat it like that. But then if you do a scan a few months later and the tumor has doubled in size, this is not a slow growing tumor. This is not a real indolent tumor. And you can't just rely on the pathology and say, I'm treating it like an indolent tumor. Maybe you'll get another biopsy and get more tissue. Maybe you'll be more aggressive, but you have to look at the um, whole uh, situation and not just rely on inadequate biopsies that are sometimes all that we have to go by. Okay, we wanna have an adequate um, diagnosis. Always think if the tumor is functional or non-functional. Functional in this context means producing hormones, if tumors are hormone producing, we call them functional. And if people have hormone producing syndromes, treating the syndromes are pretty critical. If somebody has a VIPoma syndrome and is becoming severely hypokalemic and dehydrated, and you know that is something that has to be seriously addressed, or a gastronoma syndrome, or a carcinoid syndrome, or any of these syndromes, versus non-functional, it reduces the pressure on immediate uh, action. Also, is tumor bulk causing symptoms from blocking um, important structures. If it is, you need to treat in a more aggressive fashion than if it's not. So you always have to balance outcome with toxicity, always balance the chance of achieving stable disease versus response, and consider the risk of adverse uh, events in somebody who may have a long life expectancy. In centers that treat a lot of neuroendocrine cancers, the median progression-free survival for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors is over 10 years if the patients are treated appropriately with um, optimal sequencing of therapy. So I just wanted to give that introduction and then we'll jump in. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Kim is gonna moderate the case presentations and then we'll put it all together at the end. Thank you. Great. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, interest of having a multidisciplinary panel, uh, we thought that it might be helpful to go over a few uh, select cases. And so we've got two cases for you today. Um, and so the first one is a 69 year old gentleman who presented five years ago and uh, really had had uh, uh, six months of a severe uh, diarrhea, very watery. 
uh, flushing, he had lower abdominal pain, vomiting, weight loss, and palpitations. Uh, that CAT scan uh, that he had actually had mesenteric uh, masses uh, uh, and omental masses, and specifically um, a speculated calcified mesenteric mass in the right lower quadrant um, that was very similar to the uh, CT scan that I had showed earlier. And so um, perhaps with this in mind, if I could ask a few questions of the panel, um, I guess, first of all, you know, what is your assessment? Um, second of all, how would you manage the symptoms? And, and third, how would you manage the tumor? And so, um, Dr. Dubino, I don't know if you want to start us off first, and then we'll have perhaps Dr. Wolin and, and, uh, and Dr. Gallagher weigh in as well. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank uh, Dr. Wolin and Dr. Kim for the opportunity to be part of this panel. So this patient is sort of your prototypical uh, patient with metastatic mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor uh, that you know, presents with carcinoid syndrome. Patient has the flushing, the palpitations, and the diarrhea. And from the standpoint of a surgeon, uh, has obstructive symptoms, which are uh, quite debilitating. And uh, some of them, you know, come in completely obstructed or repeated episodes of going to the emergency room. Some uh, intervention needs to be made. The obstruction is usually a result, not only of the tumor mass effect, but also of the characteristic desmoplastic reaction that you initially described would, you know, leads to kinking and distortion. So the assessment here is clearly the patient needs some sort of surgical intervention and to be more specific, some form of surgical debulking to address the primary tumor, the um, rest of the mesenteric masses, which as you said, really represent lymphatic spread um, and with probably with a cholecystectomy. The point here, the challenge here that we have is not removing only the primary tumor, but dealing with this mesenteric mess. This mesenteric masses straddle or encase major vascular structures, specifically the superior mesenteric artery. And you're caught in a very tough place. If you resect, you run the risk of having short bowel syndrome and make them TPN dependent, or you can deem a patient inoperable. Uh, so in our center, you know that we have developed a system that we have actually had more of these patients being referred to us that are deemed inoperable. And we have a, a multi-stage approach to resecting this mesentery masses. To manage the symptoms, essentially, by the time they get to a surgeon, usually they have seen you or Dr. Wallen and you have given them a, you know, their first doses of lenreotide. Uh, hydration, nutrition is very important in these patients. Um, it is alarming because some of them come completely debilitated and deconditioned. Sometimes having had, you know, considerable weight loss that pose a significant risk uh, to surgery. So in this particular case, as I said, the mass is the, is the, um, is the issue. If you show the next slide, uh, Dr. Kim. So here in our center, what we've had is we've developed, like I said, a stage approach. We refer to as a vote standing on mnemonic for endovascular occlusion and tumor excision. What it does is we use this approach for locally invasive tubers, and it's a stage approach. First, we do a mesenteric angiogram, and to really determine the extent of vascular invasion of the tumor. And while the angiogram is being done, we occlude that vessel to determine whether, you know, the occlusion is so significant, or does the patient have developed significant arterial collateralization, which is typical for the slow growing tumors. What that means is that if they have collateral blood flow, we could probably remove those blood vessels and still not have 
uh, short bowel syndrome, and then we embolize those vessels. The second stage now is the resection of the, um, ex I mean, it's the debulking of the tumor, which includes removing of the primary tumor, the lymph nodes in the mesenteric mass, and a cholecystectomy. Um, perhaps next slide, Dr. Kim. Um, this shows you the extent of the, I don't have a pointer, but the extent of the tumor. The arrow shows, is pointing the superior mesenteric artery. You can't really just go in there and resect that or else the patient is left with no uh, small bowel, which renders them with short gut. Uh, the right side shows the vascular supply of the entire small bowel and the tumor corresponding to the arrow there. Uh, next slide, Dr. Kim. So, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I thought I should actually do a little better and show you a video. So what this video, it's looping and it shows you the arrow is where the tumor is and that's the blood supply uh, there. So if I just went in there and took that, then I would render the patient with short gut. Next slide, please, Dr. Kim. So now what we do is we put a balloon in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the vessel. What the balloon does, it includes the blood flow. And it's a test for us. If we can occlude this vessel, that means that the patient can probably tolerate enough occlusion, not only that, but it also stimulates some collateral blood flow. Next slide, Dr. Kim. Now, as soon as the patient can tolerate the occlusion, we put a plug. And when we put a vascular plug there, it does a few things for us. Number one, it shows us that the patient can tolerate resection. Two, we can feel the plug. It tells us how far and how much we can resect. And number three, it actually is a controlled environment where we have less bleeding. This is a very, very challenging, uh, you know, bloody uh, procedure. So um, in this case, you can go to the next slide, Dr. Kim. So now this is the completion angiogram. Even after we have occluded the blood vessel, you still see a beautiful Christmas tree of blood vessels. That means it's okay for me to go in there the next day or the next week to resect this. Next slide. So this patient successfully was able to be uh, treated with this stage approach. He underwent a resection, underwent the resection of the mesenteric mass and a cholecystectomy. A path shows that it's a G2 multifocal, multidifferentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Patient did well with no short bowel syndrome relief with a good quality of life. Unfortunately, however, which is typical, is that after two years on lenreotide, we found progression of his metastatic disease. Um, and this is where I turn over the, uh, the, the you know, the, <laughs> and ask Dr. Kim and Dr. Wallen, what do you do? Great. So, so so I think, uh, you know, I don't know if you'd like, Dr. Wall, I don't know if you'd like to comment. Sure, I'm ha happy, happy, happy to talk. <clears throat> so th this particular patient uh, that uh, Dr. Kim was able to, so Dr. Davino was so successfully able to operate on, uh, had to first have treatment urgently for the carcinoid syndrome. One thing you don't want to do is to take somebody to surgery who has severe untreated carcinoid syndrome because there's a a big chance of having a so-called carcinoid crisis from mass, massive, massive release, not only of serotonin, but of all kinds of vasoactive amines and peptides. Here's the latest news. You, 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 you can go into shock and you can die on the, in the operating table from um, this carcinoid crisis, a tremendous release of mediators. So what you do is you start people on somatostatin analogs. In the hospital, we use an intravenous infusion of octreotide as an outpatient, you can use octreotide 
um, uh, LAR, uh, sorry, uh, uh, as an injection every four weeks, or lanreotide, 120 milligrams subcutaneously every four weeks. And in addition, patients can supplement that with subcutaneous octreotide. And if that doesn't do a, an excellent job of controlling the syndrome, we go ahead and add telotristat, which is the tryptophan hydroxylase inhibitor. And we try to get the carcinoid syndrome under maximal control. Then when the patient goes to surgery, we do that with an intravenous infusion of um, octreotide. So just remember that. Okay, so what do we do next at this point? The patient is starting to progress on a somatostatin analog. So one thing that we can do is to use peptide receptor radiotherapy. As I showed you, when you use peptide receptor radiotherapy, when you progress on a normal dose of a somatostatin analog, you could control the cancer for an average of three and a half years or so. And sometimes it can be you know, a very long time. We can use everolimus, which can control the cancer for about 11 months, but can do it with just taking a pill every day, or the patient can go on a clinical trial of a new agent. If the progression is in the liver, the patient could be treated with hepatic artery embolization. So really any of these can be used and we have to look at all the pictures as a group with interventional radiology and surgery and oncology and nuclear medicine and all the different specialties. And we talk about the pros and cons of doing it. It's very reasonable to do peptide receptor radiotherapy in somebody who has intense uptake on gallium dotatate PET. It's an excellent predictor of response. And this is a kind of patient who may very well go to peptide receptor radiotherapy um, as the next step. But uh, hepatic artery embolization is certainly something that could be considered. Next slide. Actually, just a, a little quick thing here. And actually, so PRT was recommended, and I think in view, as you said, um, Dr. Wallen, of the uh, the intense light up on the gallium scan. This is actually what this patient uh, underwent. Um, the we, the next slide is actually going to be the second case, which will be presented by Dr. Gallagher. So thank you. So um, a lot of my interest in in uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors actually relates to um, metabolism and diabetes. So the second case. I'm going to present as a patient who came to me referred by Dr. Kim, um, and he was a 59-year-old male who presented with headache, nausea, reflux, um, diarrhea, and new onset diabetes, which is how he ended up in my office. Um, he reported a 50-pound weight loss, <coughs> sorry, um, and had a recent pathological hip fracture, um, which was detected on an MRI scan. He recently started a PPI, um, and this caused improvement in his reflux symptoms, um, he reported no family history of parathyroid pituitary or pancreatic tumors, and he was noted to have this skin rash. And the rash um, initially began on his legs and then um, started appearing in other parts of his body, including his arms. So you can see the top picture here is a picture of his arm. Um, <clears throat> and you can notice there's some kind of areas of necrosis within the rash. And then the bottom picture is an area on his leg again where the rash developed. And next slide, please. So this was um, from his MRI scan. So you can see on the right side of the scan here, he had a four by four centimeter mass in the uh, tail of his pancreas um, around the um, splenic hilum. And on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see he also had a large mass in his liver, um, which was abutting the extra hepatic um, IBC and he had other mets within the liver. Next slide. And he had a workup with many, many labs that were sent. Um, so notably here, you can see um, he had a very elevated level of chromogranin A. Um, he also had uh, labs related to his blood glucose. And here, here his glucose was 98. Um, he had C-peptide and insulin levels drawn, which were normal. His glucagon level here was very elevated at over a thousand. Um, and then he also had a slightly elevated gastrin levels. And otherwise, his calcium and parathyroid hormone levels were normal, um, and he had normal um, pancreatic polypeptide, serotonin, and VIP levels. He had a biopsy then of one of the liver lesions, um, and this was found to have neoplastic cells with uh, uniform small round nuclei, um, and they were consistent with a well-differentiated um, metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. The KI67 level, which is an indicator of proliferation, was 1% to 2%. Um, next slide. So I'll open it up, I guess, to Dr. Woolen, um, as regards what you think is, uh, the origin of this tumor. Um, and if you'd like to comment on the syndrome. Okay. Well, this 
um, first of all, as, as a classic presentation of a glucagonoma. Uh, glucagonomas are pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that produce lots of glucagon. And even before seeing the glucagon level, this is a rash which is so characteristic, some people would say diagnostic of a glucagonoma, the so-called migratory necrolytic erythema uh, rash. And the new onset of diabetes, the mass in the pancreas, all of these things, and then the high glucagon um, will uh, give you a very clear diagnosis even before a pathology is available that this is a glucagonoma. It's obviously a functioning neuroendocrine tumor. Um, many functioning neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas make more than one hormone. And this tumor is also making gastrin and probably is a, a tumor manufacturing both and causing the GERD and causing the need for high doses of PPI therapy because both hormones are being made, although the gastrinoma is the one which is um, the most dominant right at the moment. And um, just be aware that it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. You can have several hormones. So the first line of treatment should never be observation. You have to do something about this because the patient is in serious trouble. You have to treat the endocrine problems as Dr. Gallagher is doing so well. And you got to treat the syndrome. Somatostatin analogs are the first line of therapy, just as they are in carcinoid tumors, using octreotide or lanreotide. And that will often give a, a long period of cancer control. Surgery is, uh, again, something that is very important. A, tr a tumor like this potentially can be resected with a distal pancreatectomy. You can take out a masses in the liver that are resectable, which in this case, the large mass uh, appears that that would be the case. Smaller masses can either be wedged out or removed with uh, uh, radio frequency or microwave ablation. If you have too many masses to resect and you have lots of tumor in the liver, you can reduce the volume by embolization. All of these things not only control the cancer, but reduce syndromes related to the hormones. So those are the things I would do right off the bat, and we can talk about other therapies later. Okay, um, I guess we'll move to the next slide just in the interest of time. So um, the patient underwent uh, surgical resection. Um, so he basically had surgery back in August, 2016 um, with resection of that mass in his distal pancreas and splenectomy along, along with resection of the liver mass. Um, and then he had in December, 2016, he basically had a dotatate scan, um, which showed uh, innumerable liver mats, which you can see here on the picture on the left-hand side. Um, and then he also had an area in his clavicle um, that showed um, mats in his bones. Um, and then he also had a, a, a lesion in his T12 vertebral body. So next slide. So subsequently, um, he was switched on to, um, so he was initially treated with octreotide and then basically um, he was noted to have um, some progression in his liver and then he was switched to lanreotide. Um, as Dr. Roland had mentioned earlier, um, it has better uh, evidence for disease control. And then he was started on a varolimus, which led to his worsening glucose control. And he also was put on denosumab for the bone metastasis. So next slide. So um, a comment just on the targeted therapies that are used um, and how they affect glucose control. So from the perspective of tumors, um, a lot of tumors are driven by growth factors. And one of my main interests is in insulin and IGF-1 and how they contribute to tumor growth. And so the insulin pathway and the IGF-1 pathway um, can activate PA3 kinase and AKT, which can lead to activation of um, and signaling through mTOR. And from a tumor perspective, um, growth factors contribute to tumor growth by increasing protein synthesis, cell growth, metabolism, and contribute to uh, tumor metastasis. So these um, pathways are often targeted with small molecule inhibitors. Um, for example, sunitinib, as mentioned earlier, is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Similarly, um, in different types of cancers, PI3 kinase inhibitors are being used, and averilimus is an mTOR inhibitor. So from the perspective of um, the tumor, that's good because it inhibits protein synthesis and tumor cell growth. Um, from the perspective of diabetes, they often contribute to diabetes. And mTOR inhibitors specifically increase uh, gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis in the liver and increase glucose output. And this results in high blood glucose levels. 
Um, and they also can uh, decrease insulin synthesis and secretion from the pancreas. And this is interesting in this situation with somebody with a glucagonoma, um, it can worsen the diabetes that already exists. In contrast, if you have somebody with an insulinoma that's producing too much insulin, then actually inhibiting uh, mTOR can actually not only reduce the tumor growth, but can also um, improve the symptoms of the hyperinsulinemia and hypoglycemia. Um, next slide. So in 2020, um, the patient had further progression. And so um, I'll hand it to Dr. Kim very quickly, I guess, to say, what would you do next if he has a uh, progression at this time? Oh, so actually, I'm going to present this to the panel. I think, you know, really, um, what would you do? So he's now uh, progressed through uh, his SSAs. Um, and so there are some options here as, as listed. Um, if anyone would like to sort of, uh, uh, sort of pitch in as to what might be some good options, Dr. Wallen, I don't know if you'd like to sure. comment here. Sure. With progression happening almost exclusively in liver, there was that little thing in the clavicle, but almost all the diseases in the liver, this would be an ideal candidate for hepatic artery embolization, potentially could be done with multiple um, treatments, treating first uh, parts of the left lobe, the right lobe where the bulk of the tumor is, and then treat the left lobe. It's often done in multiple procedures. You can do it in two, three, four uh, increments, so you don't do the whole liver at one shot but you do a section of the liver, let it recover, and then do the next section. And by doing that, it would be possible to achieve a terrific cytoreduction and save uh, systemic therapy with PRT for another day. It wouldn't be wrong to do PRT in somebody who has such intense somatostatin receptors, but I probably would do a panic artery embolization first. So uh, we skipped over in the interest of time, we skipped over the fact that he did get an embolization, but in this, uh, at this particular time, he actually did a go for PRT, um, and you can see here the you know the images um, in terms of how this looked pre PRT and, and post PRT, and just with really, a really um, terrific response. Um, and so, actually, now uh, in 2022, after six years of disease, he's doing quite well on uh, lenreotide and uh, denosumab. So, uh, I think um, in the interest of time, we wanted to wrap up with a few uh, slides on current uh, and future studies at, at uh, Sinai. So I think uh, Dr. Wallen, you wanted to uh, uh, tell everyone about uh, some of the trials of the novel therapies that are currently underway. Sure. So we have a really robust research program in neuroendocrine tumors. We have a very large trial going on right now using capazantinib, which inhibits MET as well as VEGF, unlike uh, sunitinib, which uh, does not inhibit MET. It appears to have really high activity in all kinds of neuroendocrine tumors. We're seeing terrific results. We have a, a trial of belzutifan, an oral HIF2 alpha inhibitor that targets cells that are in a so-called pseudohypoxic state, including uh, patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas and uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And it has really high activity in those types of settings. Uh, new types of PRRT, uh, we're developing trials now using an alpha emitter Alpha particles might travel 20 microns instead of traveling two millimeters, potentially can nuke the tumors with less collateral damage. We have to evaluate um, how that's gonna fit into the algorithm of um, peptide receptor radiotherapy treatment. Um, application of PRT to lung carcinoid where it's not currently approved, it's only approved in pancreas and gastrointestinal tract. Using oral somatostatin analog uh, therapy, oral um, agonists, there are trials of oral antagonists. So patients don't have to use injectables all the time for um, treating their syndrome and treating their disease with somatostatin analogs. Also using high dose uh, depot octreotide, which is in a liquid type of uh, formulation that is such a thin liquid that patients can self inject with an insulin needle, unlike the current formulations, which are very viscous and we're working on um, various types of applications of immune therapy and other um, targeted therapies for, um, for these uh, patients that are not currently available. We're doing various efforts to develop uh, studies to study the um, so-called chip mutations that can lead to development of AML or myelodysplastic syndrome to try to predict which individuals might be at risk before they get PRRT, which uh, right now is one of the 
complications of PRT. It only happens in one individual in 50. But if we could identify who that person is, we would use other treatments instead. So I just wanted to share with you some of the excitement of the research going on in this area. And Dr. Kim's going to talk about uh, other research that is happening in the department and in the uh, division. That's right. So uh, we also have a prospective net registry uh, for whom we're collecting uh, not just data, but also serum, plasma, and DNA. Uh, my interest is really in health services research um, and in uh, doing uh, uh, large uh, outcomes uh, research studies of, uh, of large data sets, uh, whether it's Sears or Medicare or multi-center registries. Um, similarly, we're looking at cancer epidemiology and trying to uh, predict how we can uh, best uh, predict outcomes in patients, um, collaborating with uh, some folks from Columbia who um, are experts in net modeling to be able to um, identify which is really the best treatment in which patients. Uh, and then also um, quite a lot of uh, biomarker de development. So um, a collaboration with Rockefeller at Queens University and looking at uh, microRNAs uh, and also uh, systems pathology with our pathology department here, uh, looking at uh, new features that can be found on digital image analysis. Uh, and then finally, some uh, basic studies as well, uh, looking at the epigenetics and immuno uh, microenvironment. So I think as you can see here, we, had, we have an unusually robust uh, center with probably one of the highest volumes in the country, if not the highest volume um, in, uh, in the US. And, uh, and really, as you can see, is really a team effort, um, very collaborative. Um, and uh, so we're always happy to see our patients um, or to provide expertise wherever we can. So thank you so much um, for your attention today, and we'd be happy to answer any questions if time allows. Thank you all very much for a very interesting and engaging panel discussion. Um, there are It's a little bit over time, but there are a couple questions for those who can stay in. Um, uh, Dr. Greenberg asked Dr. Davina, which she answered already, but uh, is there a good result from surgery? Um, patients often progress months, two years later. Are any of them likely to benefit from another operation? Dr. Davina responded about, yes, they often require more debulking. I don't know, Dr. Davina, you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the fact is that as Dr. Wallen and Dr. Kim have stress the patients they do live long lives and they are bound to present with, you know, some form of progression of disease. The point here is, I think, the, uh, trying to determine if surgery, if it's localized enough, if you could debulk a significant amount to decrease the tumor load, then it must be done. And we often do it in combination with all the other systemic therapies that are being done, including embolization of the liver, if the liver doesn't lend itself to more resection. Uh, but uh, yeah, we do, we do try to debulk as much as we can, even at a later time when they recur. Actually, this particular patient did recur. And uh, just for the, you know, for, uh, did recur and require subsequent resections for abdominal recurrence. Thank you. Uh, there's a, not one more question here. Um, with regard to non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors that show progression of disease in the liver, is there a risk for causing them to be functional or precipitating a carcinoid crisis with radiation or hepatic artery embolization? I, I could take that if you like. The tumors that are non-functional that do not have a syndrome usually do not um, suddenly start making a syndrome, but we have seen people that have had um, probably extra mutations happen as a result of therapy, temozolomide, PRRT, there are other things can cause increased mutational load over time. And we have had several patients who have been non-functional for many, many, many years, and then all of a sudden uh, present with a florid um, insulinoma or ACTH-producing tumor with Cushing's and require uh, aggressive treatment for a, a sudden development of a hormone or gastronoma. We've, we've seen all of these happen. So I think that it, it's not that it's impossible, it's just it's uncommon. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. So uh, with that, I wanted to really thank all four of you for a wonderful um, presentation today. I think uh, everyone really enjoyed it. We had a very large uh, group today at Grand Rounds. I think it was uh, all the uh, most popular names. And so I want to thank Dr. Devino, Dr. Gallagher, Dr. Kim, and Dr. Wollin um, for coming today and presenting to us. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. See you all soon. Take it easy. Thanks. Thank everyone. you.